So So nice to see you all here this afternoon uh, for this uh, training event, which is uh, dedicated to the importance of user-centered design for open science. Uh, this uh, training event is part of uh, the triple open science training series. And this is the uh, event number eight of our series. Uh, the next one uh, is scheduled for next month, the 16th of March, uh, and uh, will be dedicated to an introduction of the GoTriple Trust Building System, which is an innovative services of the GoTriple platform, and uh, with our presenters, Gael and Maxim, uh, we will go uh, deep into detail of the uh, go triple trust building system and uh, uh, triple partners will receive some news from them uh, in order to co-create uh, uh, this uh, next session together. Um, I want to give you uh, a, a few information uh, about today's webinar. We are recording uh, uh, the webinar, uh, which will be made available after. Um, and uh, in general, we are recording and storing all the mat training material of this series of events. Uh, so please check uh, the previous ones if you are interested in. Um, we uh, organized uh, this, uh, as usual, this event uh, uh, with a question and answer session at the end. So your questions are very welcome. And uh, we ask you to send them in the chat during the webinar. I'm going to collect them and then uh, present to uh, Paula uh, at the end. Uh, so let me very briefly introduce you uh, our speaker of today, uh, Paula Forbes. Uh, Paula uh, is a postdoc uh, cross-disciplinary researcher on user research, uh, and she's working across uh, social science, computer science, and life science. She is based at Abate University, and she is co-leader with uh, Stefano De Paoli of Triple uh, Work Package 3, which is about co-design and user research. So Paula, today, will focus on the work uh, VP3 and in general, the triple team is uh, doing in order to co-design the co-triple platform. So I stop sharing my screen and I give the floor to Paula for her presentation. Thank you. That's the introduction there, uh, Francesca. Okay, I'm just going to start sharing my screen. Get going. Uh, just a second. Okay. Can you all see that? Okay. Yes, perfectly. Okay. Super. Okay, so I'm not sure quite how many of you are familiar with Triple. Hopefully, most of you are by now. Um, just as a quick refresher, um, Triple has been was launched in October 2019, um, and it's going to be one of the dedicated service of operas. Um, so one of our research infrastructures supporting scholarly communication. So today I'm just going to give you a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about in this session. Um, so the session is really about user centered design um, and why it's important. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about how the Triple project has been including end users in its, re its research activities. Uh, so I recognize actually quite a few names in the audience here. So I know for a fact that some of you have actually participated in some of the activities. So you might be familiar with them, but perhaps not all of you. Um, so I'm going to go through what the, the key areas that we've been focusing on um, and, and just chat a little bit about what kind of insights that this uh, 
work has given and how it's relevant to the project. Okay, so just to refresh, um, the GoTriple platform is really helping um, to, to give social science and humanities research a bit more visibility. Um, it's hoping to improve the sort of reuse of, of uh, the material um, within the social science community, the research community, and also beyond that. Um, it's aiming to sort of really increase the societal impact of the research and also just to support researchers to be more efficient and effective in their working practice. So I've got a quick slide over here. I want you to kind of join in with me, if you will, and just type into the, the, the slide over here and just give me what you think are the main kind of aims of user-centered design. Um, I'm hoping this is gonna work. <laughs> Can you all access the, the Slido? Yes. Excellent. Um, so we'll hopefully be able to share this with you in a second. Excellent. So I can see things coming in here. So we've got sort of about usability, user friendliness, um, optimizing for user needs, um, better design, co-creation, access, ease of use, all these are yeah, pretty good. So I'm quite impressed. You've all obviously got uh, a reasonable idea. Um, I hope I'm going to be able to build on your knowledge today with the, the kind of uh, presentation here. So yeah. Definitely. So having an empathy for the users, an understanding of user journey. Um, so having a design approach that solves user needs. Um, excellent. Yes. <laughs> OK. So I just need to get back to my hang on. OK. So just going to hopefully you can see on this slide. Um, it's just a couple of examples about what happens when user needs are not considered. Um, so we've got, you can clearly see, I don't know if I would fancy sitting on that bench there, um, especially in the summer where it might be, you know, particularly smelly and having that litter drop down on top of you. Um, and you can see on the right hand side there, I don't know if you'd be able to find your way around that particular hotel um, by the numbering on the, the lift there. So that's just a, a couple of examples. If you do happen to have an interest in this, you should actually Google bad design examples and you'll find hundreds of uh, quite interesting ones. A lot of them involving toilets, actually. OK, so um, why is user-centered design important? I think you've all got a good idea, but um, it's really important to the success of all ICT projects, not just kind of a research platform like the one we're developing but to get a really sort of deep understanding of the end users and to involve them in taking relevant decisions about how the platform can work um, and, and any associated services as to how these can support the, the user's goals. Uh, so we can see from the diagram here that it's not just a, a sort of linear process, it's quite iterative, so it's, it's a circle. Um, so we start off at the top sort of understanding the context of use um, which then leads to kind of specifying user requirements, which lead to design solutions. Um, and then these design solutions are actually evaluated against the initial requirements. Um, but it doesn't stop there because um, we, we often find issues when we do do this evaluation. So we have to that kind of go back around um, a bit of a redesign process until we eventually come out of the circle, hopefully at the end of the project with a successful design solution. Okay, so what did we do to understand our user needs? Um, so we really did sort of need to identify who our target users are. Um, so for this instance, the, the main users will be SSH, SSH, so social science and humanities researchers. Um, but we also want to 
to consider what other users might use the platform. Um, so these are our secondary users. So we thought that you know citizens with an interest in research, they might use it, um, perhaps journalists or companies, other users like that. So we did also include those in our um, in our kind of user research, especially quite early on. Um, so to fully understand the user needs, we conducted about 30 different interviews um, with researchers and also a few with these um, other stakeholders. Um, and we really needed to make sure we covered all the different social science and humanities disciplines. So we had a lot of support from our other colleagues within Triple to kind of reach out to these people because most of the people I know are kind of sociologists. So we just wanted to make sure we had a really good spread of, of different uh, people. So these um, initial 30 interviews were then transcribed um, and anal analyzed using sort of thematic analysis. Um, and I used in vivo to help with this. Um, and alongside the, this kind of qualitative research, we also did a kind of large scale survey, which included some more kind of quantitative information. Um, and the survey managed to get 925 responses um, from over like, well, from 26 different EU countries, which I, I thought was uh, quite a good effort, really. So that was good to see. OK, so we can see on, on this slide the kind of um, journey, really, from these um, taking the interviews, doing the analysis. Um, and after the themes were identified from this, um, the early interviews, um, I then went on to develop some personas and scenarios. Um, and these are then used to actually define the user requirements uh, and the user needs of the platform. Um, and this is really sort of, so the definition of the user needs becomes the moment where um, the designers and developers can then evaluate these sort of concrete options um, and decide which ones can be prioritized, which ones maybe can be discarded. Um, but they're, they're basing the, this um, decisions on actual empirical evidence and analysis and not just taking a guess on what the user needs. And that's the, the kind of real importance of, you know, why this user center research is so important. Uh, so you can see on the right hand side, this is just an example of one of the the research personas. Um, and we really kind of tried to make it more goal focused because um, personas have been a little bit criticized. Sometimes they can kind of reinforce um, stereotypes and a bit of bias, but, but they're really sort of focused on the goals that that user has for, um, for their work um, and any pain points that we kind of identified um, in the kind of early research. Okay, so this example was one of the, the non-researcher personas. Um, so we included a couple of these. Um, so we can see this person is actually um, the CEO of a small business who's wanting to access um, research information to make sure that uh, the evidence is reflected in his kind of business practice. Um, so yeah, so as I say, we've kind of used these personas, then the persona leads on to like a, a scenario, which a scenario is basically a story of how the persona or how this particular person would interact with the future platform that we're developing. So you can see this is an example of one of the, um, the scenarios here. Um, this is um, Carolina, sort of a, a PhD student, and it just tells the story of how she can interact um, with the GoTriple platform. And this, of course, is before it's been developed, so it's kind of good to get um, a bit more of an idea in your head by the story as to what the platform would be able to do. Um, and it's from these scenarios that we then go on to extract the user requirements. Um, so this is the list of user requirements that were pulled from, from that particular scenario. Um, so she was actually wanting to get sort of um, some tailored search results that would be you know, sent to her. Um, so yeah, so this is the, the, the list, um, the various requirements. And from these, um, we gather all of them from all of the different scenarios. Um, and then we can do a bit of organization. So we organize them by feature rather than by the scenario that they came from, because they quite can be quite random. Um, the different features that are discussed in each scenario. Um, so we group them then. So this one is grouped by accessing data sets. And once we've got all of these requirements, um, it then becomes a, a case of doing the sort of prioritization. 
So this is done not just as work package three, it's done with all the relevant stakeholders in the platform. So it's done with the developers, um, the kind of designers, um, also the business, there's lots of work done on work package seven. So we did some kind of benchmarking and uh, uh, looking at uh, competitor platforms and what would be useful to, to include that were really useful features from the, the competitors. And so all of that knowledge then goes into this kind of prioritization exercise. So we can see here that the, there are a few different colored lists. Um, so the, the green one on the far side was, yes, it needs to be done now. Um, the lilac -y color was, yeah, it might be, it's important maybe that we should do that next. So it's, it's, it can be really, uh, you know, an important time to kind of prioritize which features are gonna be built first, um, which can maybe be delayed um, and which ones we could just do at this time at the end. Um, so, and also this, this kind of list also then assigns who's going to be responsible for, for you know, implementing these and who's going to actually have to write the code for the different features. So I hope that's given you a bit of an insight into how all the kind of, the, the kind of early interviews and some of the more woolly things then lead to this, you know, this point where you've actually got a list of the um, actual user requirements. Okay, so as well as this like specific requirements, which then the, the developers are able to go along and, and start building the platform. Um, so at that point, actually, we realized early on in the, the kind of interview process that um, the discovery process is really highly complex and uh, it's using a lot of different tools. It's not just using one uh, particular you know, tool to do this. So there's an awful lot going on. Um, so we really thought it would be particularly useful to get more of an in-depth understanding of um, the way that social science and humanity research has worked. Um, what were the tools that they used? How do they interact with these? Um, all this kind of thing, because there's a definite sort of ecosystem of the different tools and they interact with each other. Um, so we thought, thought this next phase of research was important to kind of understand this in more detail. So we also had the additional challenge of um, the COVID, which everybody else has also had to deal with. It wasn't unique or anything. We're all dealing with this, but I think initially we'd planned to do some kind of face-to-face -face work with researchers, um, but that obviously had to change. Um, so we needed to look at ways as to, to be able to continue to get this deep understanding of, of researchers' working practice. Um, so we adapted our methods really to, to be able to continue to be able to, to make these insights. So um, I had a look at different online tools um, for being able to, to work remotely with researchers. Um, so a couple of the ones that I looked at were Miro and also Mural. Um, and I had a go with both of them, but I decided that actually I quite liked using Miro. It seemed to have a nice clean interface. M Mural was also good, could have actually used either of them, um, but I went with Mural. And it's been very good, I think, for, for the project and uh, other work pa packages have been using it too. Um, so yeah, so we needed some kind of methodology and different ways of, of making sure that we understood what the researchers were doing um, and how they were kind of interacting with different tools. So we decided to take sort of a double way of looking at it. So one way would be to actually um, to go online and watch the researchers going through a process. And this was what we call a cognitive walkthrough of the user journey. So we're getting them to, to really think aloud. So they're, they're doing a search online, but talking about what they're doing as, we're going, as they're going through the process. So we did a few of these, um, but we also had a, a kind of, there was a newer method that we'd seen. So we had this um, a method by Bodka et al, um, and they'd had this paper-based um, method, and it was actually using paper stickers to be able to map the artifacts used by a volunteer community. And I thought that, that research was actually be a really kind of nice way to, to go ahead with the social science and humanities community. We could look at the, in a similar way, but not on paper because that would require kind of face-to-face. -face. So we adapted this technique to, to be able to do it digitally. Okay, okay so. So the artifact ecology mapping is what we've kind of called it. Um, and as I say, the, the, the whole process of discovery involved working with these multiple different tools. 
um, and across various different devices as well. Um, so the fact that the, that the use of just one individual interactive artifact, um, we can't just understand it in isolation. We kind of need to understand how it fits into the whole ecosystem. Um, so of course in a living world, and I think I, I mentioned, I know Francesca mentioned, I have this life science background, but actually a lot of things that do fit in. So in a living world that an organism only survives if it has a niche and it's fit for purpose. And actually it's just the same for digital tools. So we really need to, to make sure that the, the Go Triple platform is able to survive in, the, in amongst all the, you know, the other things that are out there. Um, so we wanted to map these different artifacts that researchers were using and also the kind of understand the context of use and any kind of you know, difficulties and pain points that they were having. So to go back to the cognitive walkthrough, we kind of ran these two methods simultaneously and I had some help certainly with the cognitive walkthrough um, with Daria. So they supported this task and did a lot of the cognitive walkthroughs, which is great. Um, and the aim of it was to, you know, just to, as I said before, to understand what the researcher is doing. It's, um, so we recorded this um, in real time, but just would talk us through the, the process. Um, we had a script for, for what they can, you know, for chatting to the researcher, but we didn't give them anything, you know, we didn't say you have to go and use whatever it is, we just wanted them to use the tools that they normally did, um, and then we would capture what was going on. Um, at the end of that, we'd kind of taken the, the method as we were using in the, the kind of um, artifact ecology mapping, so at the end of the walkthrough, then we would create this map um, based on what the, the user had done in that session. And so this is just an example of, of one of the kind of searching points. So we had this, you know, kind of quite a nice way of visually seeing what they were doing. Um, and we did, again, we found that it was quite diverse. So different researchers were doing different things. Here's another example. Um, and it identifies here, you can see on this one, kind of one of the pain points. So if something that wasn't open access, um, then they had an issue, they might resort to using shadow libraries. Um, and if that wasn't successful, then they might have to then go and contact the author, which obviously takes time. Um, so it's interesting to see the kind of various methods that the, the researchers were using. Um, um, but then we thought it was really interesting as well as, as having this uh, the walkthrough to, to try and sort of compare um, what we were finding there with this new technique that we developed about the artifact ecology mapping. Um, so as I say, this was a kind of using a, um, the stickers, but we would made them digital to get the researchers to kind of map out their discovery process. Okay. So, so to define the kind of bounds as to what we were looking at, um, this diagram here just shows you, um, so the bottom layer um, here just describes a user interacting with a single digital artifact. Um, we, that's not the case for discovery. Um, so we really realized that, um, but at the same time, I don't need to know every single digital tool that uh, a particular person works with. So I don't need to know that they're gonna use Messenger to, to you know, organize lunch with their friends. Um, what I did want to know was anything to do with their kind of working practice around research, interacting with other people and anything to do with the research process. Um, so that kind of defined what we were looking at within the, the different uh, the methods we were using. Okay, so this is just the, the kind of instructions that we'd follow. Um, so as I say, we were using Miro, so we'd set up a board in advance with the different uh, uh, tools and the sticker board that we'd made digital. We had that there. Um, we'd then send the participant a link to a Teams meeting along with any kind of informed consent forms that were needed because we were gonna be recording the session. So they had to be filled in and, and to get the prior agreement of the, the person involved. Um, so this participant would then join the Teams meeting uh, where we would share the link to the Miro board. Um, this could then be, you know, be recorded. So we would record what they were doing on the board. Um, and at the end of the session, it was great. We could actually generate a rough transcription of the chat um, so we had like, it wasn't 100% accurate, but it was enough to kind of give you um, something to look back on if something wasn't maybe clear. Um, or you could go back and just actually re-listen to, to anything that, you know, needed clarified at the end. Um, but we found it a really useful technique. 
So this slide just shows you what the digital sticker board looked like. Um, and this was an example of the map that I created just to give them an idea of what we were looking for. Um, this, I think, was quite an early version. Um, and we found that the sticker board actually evolved as we went along because people would tell me, oh, I use this tool, which I'd never heard of. So I'd be you know, slowly adding to the sticker board um, as the process went on. Um, and we, I'll show you the next slide, I think, as, uh, gives you an overview. Um, so this would be what the whole Nero board would look like. Um, so the top item, you know, the top left there, I'd created some kind of tried to give a bit of a visualization um, to the participant to explain what the triple platform was, was about. Um, the fact that it was a multilingual platform, um, we were aiming to have these kind of visual discovery tools within it. Um, the fact that it would involve a recommender system, have annotation tools. So all of that um, was kind of in that kind of the one where that you can see the cloud was just trying to explain what triple was quite in a visual way. Um, at the beginning of the, the um, workshop, we had to onboard the users because often they've never been, you know, encountered Miro before. So we had a bit of a practice session. Um, so we might just have a, a kind of practice way. We have like post-it notes and get them to write a name on a post-it and just move it around just to get used to the different ways of working in Miro. But we found that most everybody picked it up quite quickly. It's quite, quite intuitive. Um, again, there's my example of the map that I just showed you. Um, but you can see at the bottom in the middle there, that would be an example of one of the maps that were created. Um, so it just shows you the kind of quite rich um, information that we gathered about the, the whole research discovery process. So this is just a, a kind of a bigger version of a different participant. Um, and we can see how the method actually was, was really quite useful for visually identifying what the pain points were. Um, so I should say as well, I would kind of talk them through the process as well as we were doing it. I would be chatting to them in a kind of interview type way, but uh, you know, prompting or what, what do you maybe do to, to collaborate with people, you know, just to make sure that all this information was included um, on, the, on the map. But we did find that the, you know, especially having the stickers there, the visual prompts, um, they, they could say, oh, I actually do use that tool and I use it for this. So it was, it was actually quite useful. Um, but we found that the maps could be created reasonably quickly um, and that people created these wonderfully rich and detailed maps of their, you know, user journeys, really. Um, we can see that this one here, again, we've got the pain point of uh, somebody encountering a paywall. Um, and the one at the bottom, you might see, um, so this user had told us that they'd recently deleted their academia account because they had uh, an overload of notifications. So that kind of thing is really a, a cautionary tale for, for us to take on board. So we need to make sure that we're not going to overwhelm users by sending them you know, constant notifications. We need to put them more in control of that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so after, after, the, after we'd done quite a few of the different maps actually, um, I then went back and wanted to kind of do this kind of remapping. So what I did was basically make a copy of the original map, but then um, on the second map, um, I would actually do this grouping. So I, I tried to, you know, put the, the items in. It was, it was not that hard to do, but it was like, so we can see by this one here, we've got like the searching tasks is in the light blue color. Um, people would just, you know, they were looking at finding people. So that's on the bottom right in the kind of mint green color. Um, so it was just a kind of, pull out what kind of activities were going on and what tools were being used in these different activities, but also to see how they kind of also interacted. Um, and we can see on this example, so somebody was doing totally different things on the, the tablet or the phone that might make, use different tools there and work in quite a different way. So it was just interesting to see the, these kind of, uh, you know, how these different processes were and, and the different pain points. Okay, so the, what do we think about the method adaptation? Um, so I think it was actually quite useful for us. So the benefits of being able to do this kind of remote work actually outweighed any constraints on the method, I think. Um, one, we weren't having to travel anywhere. It was like really quite easy to be able to do these with anybody in any country. Um, so it made it a lot easier. 
Um, there were some excellent templates on Miro that were, you know, we could use for inspiration as to how to work with the um, with the participants. But for these ones, we actually created our own templates and, uh, and did, did it that way. Um, I found the recordings of the session quite useful because sometimes you, you might need to go back and, and just uh, re-listen to something that might, you know, might not be clear. Um, but the completed boards actually were really very visual. And it was quite nice to be able to share these kind of visual results with the other team members so they can quickly get an overview. Whereas if it's just, if you have a, um, you know, a transcribed interview, it can be quite difficult to kind of fully understand the different tools because it's just a paragraph of writing and uh, it, it can be, you know, much harder to, to get this kind of good overview of the different tools that people are using. Okay, so what were the, some of the insights? Because we were, obviously, as I said at the beginning, it's, it's important to pull out insights from the work that we were doing. Um, so we found that the, um, actually the search pathways are often quite complex and multi-stage. Um, so common starting point was actually often Google or Google Scholar. Um, and these could then lead to other gateways to different research portals. And um, so some the more specialized or kind of discipline specific libraries might be um, looked at next. Um, so, for example, Scopus or Il Sevier, something like that. Um, then the users were, were kind of coming across this kind of silo effect of the different disciplines. So we found as well, and this probably might not be massively new, but it was interesting, this idea of the cascading discovery, where the, the researcher finds one relevant article to be then moves on to be a really useful source for others that are of interest. So they either look at the kind of citations, which has been the kind of more traditional way of, of doing it. But now, thanks to the, the kind of metrics being available on the digital platforms, they're actually now also able to view what future articles, you know, so articles published in the future have cited that source as well. So it's not just the looking back, it's the looking forward, which was, uh, you know, really quite important. Um, so we found that the, the kind of often issues around the sort of lack of common ontologies or word usage um, across these different disciplines um, and that people were having to several searches to kind of cover these. That was a really common issue, um, especially when working in kind of multidisciplinary areas. Um, and we also found that actually people um, changed their work practice. Um, when they were ended up collaborating with other people. So they might do things one, one way when they're on their own and just working on their own way, um, but it changes as they collaborate. Um, so there was the kind of, you know, the ubiquitous issue of lack of open access, um, but not just the lack of open access, you know, the, not just been this open access issue, but actually the researchers were saying it's quite frustrating to not have this as being really clearly labeled because uh, they then waste time um, in trying to access something which could have, you know, been labelled as not available. Um, the other thing that was quite important was that they had a need to have a link to the original uploaded article and not just a kind of copy of a PDF. Um, and this was important as the original link might have other associated data. Um, so it might have a data set, for example, that might be with it or other things that are from the original version. Um, and actually, it's the, the, there's an issue of trust there as well, so it was more trustworthy, um, but also for tracking metrics, and this was more important to researchers for people accessing their own um, research publications. And um, so it's important for, for being able to track the number of downloads, for example, of the research, um, and it's often a you know, kind of measure of impact, um, so that was found to be important. And of course, there's like issues such as having to rename PDFs that just have a number to kind of make them more sensible. So there's issues like that. And so lots of different things that were found really from the, the research that we did. Okay, so just to reflect on, as I said before, we did compare two different methods for looking at the same type of work. Uh, so just to make a quick comparison here. Um, so the cognitive walkthrough, the benefit of it is that it doesn't rely on memory at all. So the researcher is actually going through the task um, in situ, the, the, in, the, in the moment doing that task, it doesn't rely on memory. Um, so this means it can be used for things that maybe they don't do all the time, some things that are just occasional because they're not having to remember. Um, 
but the focus is on a, a sort of single device. So we're just focusing on what they're doing on the, the kind of computer or laptop at the time. Um, but we found from the, comparing the results that the results um, end up as being a quite, you know, more, more of a linear, less divergent workflow. Um, but it was an accurate portrayal of the user journey. Um, so they were taking us through there. There was no margin of error or forgetting something. Um, but the focus was really on a time constrained interaction. It was just on that 30, 40 minutes that the user was there on, you know, doing the, the walkthrough test. So it wasn't, it didn't include anything that would happen out with that time. Um, but it was really useful for seeing their pain points and what was going on at that time. Um, so in contrast, the artifact ecology mapping, um, it did rely to a certain extent on the memory of the researcher um, for remembering what they did. Um, so in that respect, it's actually use, it's probably limited to things that they do a lot and that are well known to them. Um, so you couldn't do it for something that, you know, they do very occasionally. Um, but we did find actually having the stickers for the different icons was acting as a, a prompt as well. So they would remember because they've got the visual information in front of them. Um, we found that the ecology mapping was able to take into account multiple devices and different tools. So it could say what they did on the tablet, what was going on, you know, they might use their phone for certain things. And we were able to map this in a way that their, their cognitive walkthrough didn't. Um, we believe it to be accurate that, again, we can't say for certain as much as we can for the cognitive walkthrough. Um, but the benefit of it, the main benefit, what I found was it took into account a sort of longer term interactions. Um, and this was actually really important because the discovery process is a longer term interaction. It's not just one time focused event. It's things that are happen happening over a period of months, years sometimes, you know, so it's uh, the, the ability to be able to map these longer term interactions, which has traditionally been very difficult um, and really only done by interviewing people. Um, so the fact that we've got this more visual way to take into account these longer term interactions has been the sort of main benefit of the method. Um, and because it was taking into account the longer term interactions, it was actually very useful for capturing things, perhaps that the user hadn't done themselves. Um, so for example, things like push notifications being sent to them. So they might interact with the interact with these. Um, or for example, where they're doing collaborative work, um, somebody else might be working on a document or adding things to the kind of research material. So it was able to kind of capture the, the kind of other things that might be going on that might not be an active action that, of the researcher at a given moment. So it was, it was great for capturing that kind of uh, process. Okay, so I don't know if we want to stop and have questions now or if we just want to keep going and you can ask me questions right at the end. I think Francesca had an idea of asking them at the end, but I'm going to move on, if not, to um, the kind of next phases and to look at um, the kind of innovative services of GoTriple. Maybe we can, uh, I gather a few questions and maybe we can uh, look at them and then uh, continue. So to have a very short break. Uh, in your presentation. So the first question uh, is about uh, which tools are you using from Agnieszka? Uh, hello, Agnieszka. Which tools are you using for wireframes, Figma, Adobe XD? Is there an open so, access option for researchers? Um, I know um, if this isn't, this is Julio's domain. Um, so Julio is our designer, he's making an excellent job of things, but um, I know initially he was using, oh my god, what's it called? Um, he's just moved over, he's now using Figma and he was using, can you remember, can anybody remember? I've forgotten the name of it. Um, InVision, InVision it is, yeah, so yeah, <laughs> that's it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. so he was using that, but I don't think there are any of them are free to use. I think they're all paid for platforms, which makes it quite difficult to kind of for new people who are learning the design process to actually use them. Um, actually, no, Figma, you can get a free version of Figma, but you want to get a limited amount of, of uh, I think, maybe areas to use. You might just have one or two things that you can have, whereas I think if you pay for it, you get a lot more. Um, so yeah, so we've just moved over to Figma. 
Thank you, Paula. And uh, I have a second question from Simone Sacchi. Hi, Simone, nice to see you. Can I ask uh, how you decide on the not to do? On the not to do, yeah. <laughs> That's the hardest ones, I think. Um, so I think in not just the, the kind of work that I did, I think some of it was also um, the kind of business analysis and the work done in work package seven where they were looking at competitor platforms um i think this actually part of it was we need to understand the other tools that that people are using because some of them are very ingrained uh, so for example the, the the fact that researchers use Z um, zotero and mendeley for actually storing their references because i think initially when i first started i envisaged that go triple might be able to encompass all of these things and do everything you know but um as we kind of went on with that was probably you know a lot of work and the fact that that researchers probably already have Zotero um Zeno, you know the, the Zotero or Mendeley and they have this and they're probably not keen so we decided that for that it would just be important to be able to save the things that they find on Go Triple and to be able to have it compatible with uploading the research material to these existing items so things like that so some of the others might just be too technically difficult, but I mean, I think most of them, it was like, if it was something that we knew that the user really wanted and they really, you know, that would be a key thing we wanted to include. But sometimes it would just be an occasional, oh, that might be quite, yeah, it might be okay, or it might be quite nice, then that's obviously up for discussion as to whether it's highly important or not. But, but yeah, it is difficult to kind of say, right, we're not doing that. Thank you, thank you very much. I see that uh, Agnieszka and Simone are thanking you as well. So there are no more questions. Uh, I'll move on to the innovative services and there might be more questions at the end then, okay. Okay, so um, as Go Triple will be also made up of um, several innovative services, we actually needed then to know what the user needs would be for each of them. Um, so in Work Package 3, we ran different co-design workshops on various aspects. So, um, so I myself did the ones on crowdfunding, annotation and recommend assistance. Um, so Mio, you, so you need to attend the next um, training session in next month. So this will be Mio and they're going to be explaining all about their trust building system. So I'm not going to go into detail of that today because they're, they're going to be explaining that to you. Um, and also the visual discovery, which I don't know if any of you were at the last triple training session. So we had OK Maps were presenting the visual discovery. So I'm just going to touch very briefly on this, but um, not too much because it wasn't done by myself. OK. So the first thing, um, so first um, service really that I focused on was the recommender system. Um, so we had initially a number of meetings with the developers um, who were the partner, our partner, No Center. Um, so we really chatted with them to kind of fully have an understanding and to, you know, to, to reach a set of objectives that were important to them to know, you know, what I could maybe find out from the users as to what would be important, you know, for them to know um, in the development of the recommender system. Um, so we had some meetings and we agreed on the following kind of things to find out. So it was um, how much control um, does a user want over the type and frequency of data that um, GoTriple might recommend to them? Um, how much of an explanation should be given as to why that, that recommendation has been given to them? Um, so this is about sort of the transparency of the system. Um, we wanted to find out what factors um, are important for recommendations um, of other researchers uh, and would they like to receive this kind of serendipitous recommendation? So maybe things that are a bit more surprising that they might not expect as much. Um, and also to, to look at how important um, potential biases are because uh, recommender systems and, uh, kind of can introduce bias. So things like gender, career level, that kind of thing. And so this just gives you one of the little boards that we had on the mirror. There was multiple different tasks and, and frames that we worked within, much like you know the one I showed you earlier from the, um, the mapping session. Um, but this is just one of the, the kind of methods. So we had people sharing with us what kind of recommendations that they currently received, um, 
how frequent were they and how useful they found them. So there was like this kind of uh, interaction going on here. Um, but basically, um, the results of the workshop in general, um, we found that uh, the importance of different items that people could have recommended to them wasn't static, um, actually changed over time, and it might depend on the stage of the research that they're at. Um, so that obviously has important, um, I, you know, important implications for us as you know, people who are developing the platform. Because what that means is that the users should then be able to easily modify the preference settings to, to be able to allow for that kind of level of flexibility. So, for example, at one point, it might be useful for them to have a lot of research. Um, so publications recommended at another stage where they may be putting a proposal together. They maybe want to look at other projects or different researchers who they might want to collaborate with. So that kind of aspect. So, as I say, it's not static. Okay, um, so we also found that the push notifications were useful to the to the users, but they definitely wanted control over them so that they didn't become excessive. And, uh, you know, we really don't want people to disengage with GoTriple. We want to avoid that at all costs. Um, so again, the user should have control over both the kind of information they receive and in the kind of frequency. And uh, they should be able to stay, right, I'll have them every week, every month, every day, you know, but be able to have that choice. Um, so we found that they were actually quite interested in knowing why they, they got certain recommendations. So this kind of idea of having quite a transparent system. So an example of that might be, oh, you have been recommended this item because you read this paper. You know, so it might be, you know, something as simple as that, just to explain where the recommendation is coming from. Um, they did want to be sort of surprised um, with recommendations from different peers and articles. Um, they quite liked the idea of that, uh, not just always being very predictable. Um, but they overall, they said that the publications were probably the most important thing that they wanted to get regular notifications on. Um, otherwise, they say that they've got the option to, to choose um, in the preferences. Okay. So that was kind of a summary of the recommender system. Um, the next thing we focused on was the crowdfunding service. Um, so again, for gaining insights into you know, what are the important features of a crowdfunding solution. Um, and we quickly realized actually that for, for this um, group, this, this item, there were actually two different end user groups um, and that we really needed to consider both of them. So we needed to look at the funders. So for example, members of the public that might be um, you know, willing to contribute to the crowdfunding of social science and humanities research, and also the researchers themselves who would be setting up, um, possibly setting up a crowdfunding campaign. So again, we had um, sort of prelim preliminary discussions with the relevant people from other work packages and the people involved in who'd be going to implement the crowdfunding. Um, so we to find out what they wanted uh, me to find out in the sessions, in the different workshops. Um, so for the citizens, so they would be potential funders. Um, we found that they, they wanted to find out if they would be willing to fund sort of social science and humanities projects via crowdfunding. Um, what kind of concerns would they have about the type of funding? Um, what factors would motivate them to fund projects? And also how they would maybe like to be kept informed about the projects that they might contribute money to. Um, but for the researchers, there were different questions. Um, so for, for this group, we wanted to find out, again, if they'd be keen on using uh, this type of funding, you know, this type of platform to get crowdfunding. Um, we wanted to find out if the relevance and quality, um, how really the relevance and the quality of any project proposal could be ensured. Um, and also to look at how they would like funds to be managed. Um, and then also there was a separate kind of thing about how could the platform support them in being able to create a crowdfunding um, appeal. Um, so things like how much do they want to, you know, to know about promoting a project or setting it up in the first place, that kind of uh, support practice. Um, so this just shows one of the, again, just one item from the board. There were quite a lot of different um, uh, tasks for the, the participants to do. Um, but this was just looking at the kind of main motivations for crowdfunding. Um, and we found that, that the, the kind of really key ones were 
if the research was going to be for the common good, um, if people had like an empathy with the, what was you know the cause, um, and if they were kind of quite interested in the topic. Um, things that were also important, but in, they were kind of grouped in the more medium importance, were having a well presented uh, research proposal, perhaps with sort of good visual, um, good visual presentations. It might have an associated video. Um, it might be of local interest to people, um, and also they might have heard of it or have had a recommendation by by somebody that they knew. Um, so for the researchers workshop, again, we had the this um, this is an example of the kind of support features that we would need. Um, so things that were scoring really highly were was having information on how to put together a proposal, on how to promote that proposal, um, and having online instructions and finding people to collaborate with. Slightly less is the instructional video, past examples, PDF. Um, and how to create a video. Um, so to ensure how, you know, the, the high quality of research, um, this was a bit more of a qualitative task. So we had to, we we're just asking them what they thought should happen. Um, so we can see the kind of various post-it notes at the bottom. Um, but from these, we gathered that actually having peer review would be quite important. Um, also defining the milestones quite clearly in any particular proposal. Um, having a media strategy for the dissemination of the research material at the end, so making sure that that knowledge is, you know, is freely available. Um, stating where the results will be published, for example, in open platform, you know, having it on Zenodo uh, or somewhere like Open Edition. Um, and they also thought it would be quite important to, to have this kind of regular correspondence with the, the, the funders. Um, so perhaps maybe via an email or uh, information email or a newsletter that was regularly sent. Um, it was also important to be really transparent about the research process and results, um, and they should have sort of clear data management protocols. Um, but again, they found you know sort of they depend on the audience that they might have um, need to have different output streams for maybe the academic and non-academic um, audiences, and making sure that they were they were covered. Um, and also having a sort of stamp of approval from a sort of recognized institution or internationally sort of recognized scholar might be important in terms of trust. Okay, so the next thing we moved on to was annotation insights. Um, so as GoTriple is going to have this um, annotation system, um, and this is going to be developed by our partner Net7. Uh, who are kind of working on the, the pundit annotation system and um, they'll be integrated into GoTriple. So we needed to chat with them to find out um, what kind of problems or issues um, or needs that they, they thought we might you know, be able to investigate um, in terms of the kind of in terms of the end user. Um, so again we created a set of objectives. Um, so we wanted to understand in the, the workshops why people actually make annotations. Um, what kinds of annotations do they make? Um, what problems do they face when, when making annotations? Um, what particular features would be most important to them? If they ever use semantic annotation? Um, and what different tools do they actually use? And what would be the, the kind of user journey for, for making annotations? Okay, so these two, um, you can see again, we're kind of using this kind of... Uh, mapping again. So um, apart from identifying with the different features, we, we asked them to kind of give us a bit of a visual display using the same kind of mapping techniques that we developed earlier on. Um, but we found that um, actually it was again a bit like the, the kind of searching. It was very, I hadn't realized quite how many different annotation tools there are and quite how much that the, you know, the, the use of the, these varies wild, widely. Um, so there are a lot of different tools being used and for different purposes. Um, so but basically annotations may be made for, for keeping track of ideas or insights. Um, they might be used to add detail to or expand text, uh, to summarize text, to create a pointer or a reminder for future review. Um, but we kind of found a bit of a common theme in that most people, uh, certainly the ones involved in, in the task in the workshops that we ran, um, there was kind of a, a three phase um, process. So generally people would have a quick skim of any material, just a quick read. 
um, then they would go a more detailed read and at that point is whether the annotations would be made, um, any you know sections would be highlighted or notes made. Um, and then there'd be a third phase of this kind of compilation. So they might do several of those, you know, maybe highlighting PDF forms or whatever it may be. Um, and then at the end, this compilation, often involving a new document, perhaps a new Word document, where the notes and different annotations um, would be kind of pulled together um, to create this kind of bigger research overview of the material that they've been working on, um, pulling in maybe the different annotations that were made from the various different papers. Um, so from this uh, workshops, what we actually found was that um, there were several kind of quite desirable features. We're not highly convinced that all of them are technically feasible, but we weren't going to, you know, ask them to, to understand the technical feasibility. We just wanted to know what they would like. Um, so these are the things they came up with, which was ability to automatically track in the notes where the text came from. Um, perhaps the ability to export annotations to the, the kind of reference libraries such as Zotero and Mendeley. Um, a few copied texts from a publication, they thought it would be fantastic if an automatic citation is generated, which I would quite like as well, but I'm not sure it's going to happen quite yet. Um, I think it's eTag reference, which is probably a similar type thing. Um, they wanted multiple participants to be able to make annotations at the same time, so that was felt as being important. Um, and also this kind of synchronous backup of all devices. So perhaps you might be making um, a couple of um, highlighting things on a tablet that that should then you know sync so that when you look at things on your computer, it's, it's got the same annotation. So that was important. Um, so yeah, various different things. And what's the bottom one? Adding in multiple papers and organizational tools for notes on specific topics. So the next, um, section here, which was the visual discovery, which I myself, as I mentioned, didn't do. This was done by OK Maps. I'm just going to briefly touch on this because they actually covered it really well in the last session. Um, but they were looking at um, how the visualiz visualization tools could you know, support SHS researchers and their objectives were actually to, to look at what the important use cases and benefits would be. Um, both for their, they've got two different kinds of visualization. So they have the knowledge map and the stream graph. Um, and they're quite different, so they wanted to identify what the kind of best uses those would be um, to identify additional ideas for the different tools um, and really understand what the kind of multilingualism, what role multilingualism plays in their research discovery process. Um, to understand which tools um, people use and what use cases to focus on and to inform decision design choices for the visualization tools. Um, so this one is their knowledge map insights so that they kind of, you know, um, what they found was the users were telling them it was really, really useful for them to get an overview of an unknown research topic. Often researchers will know about their own field, but perhaps they might want to look at something new. Um, and for this, it was really useful to get this kind of gripped um, understanding and having that visual overview. Um, they also was useful in finding academics and key researchers within an area of expertise. It was useful in identifying disciplines that might do research on a topic of interest. Um, and it could also be, yeah, I think it was important that, that to display the, yeah, they looked at what metadata there was important. So things like having the title, author, year, keywords, um, link to the document, and also the abstract that people can read. Um, so again, they looked at this was the stream graph, which is the other visualization. Um, and I think what they found in the insights for this was that um, um, it was really useful for them to find out how different terminology is used across different disciplines. Um, it was useful in identifying emerging, to emerging topics over time um, and understanding sort of hot topics at the moment. You could see the kind of visual explosion of, uh, of a research area. Um, but they also found that, that the users were suggesting that the streams could also be used to represent maybe authors or keywords um, or different sources based on kind of content analysis. So some perhaps different use cases that might be worth looking at. 
So we're getting towards the end now. I'm just going to go on to evaluation methods. So that was the kind of in, um, really the insights that we had for the innovative services. Um, and as most of you are probably aware, we had our beta release um, that happened in October. So, so late last year, we had uh, the beta version of the platform was released. Um, and since then, we've been really having a focus on um, doing some user testing to, to make sure that the, what's been developed is, is usable. Um, identifying any issues that might arise and to, to feed that back to the developers. Um, so we've recently created a beta testing group. So thanks to any of you who may, may have signed up for that. I found it really useful, I have to say. It's great having a kind of pool of people and not having to, you know, to start annoying people, to find people. So um, it's been great. And so what we've been doing is um, having users walk, go through the platform to give them some tasks to complete, um, to watch them, to see if there are any issues. Um, it's, again, it's kind of similar to the cognitive walkthrough, but this time we're actually using the GoTriple platform. Um, so yeah, carrying out that. Um, and late last year, we also did um, a campaign. Um, we collaborated with a, um, another European project called Reach Out, um, who helped us um, have a platform for setting, we were able to set um, uh, a kind of scenario that people could walk through um, and they would do that and then complete the survey on sort of, you know, how usable they found it, if there were any issues. Um, so that was quite useful. Um, so this was kind of just a quick um, the testing scenario that the, the users were asked to follow. So they'd be given, you know, a goal to find which authors published the most. Um, one of them was to, to produce the knowledge map that we just looked at, um, and then the stream, the stream graph. So just some tasks to go through and uh, any issues would then be reported back. Um, so the reach out campaign. Um, so we got 20 fully complete questionnaires from this, um, several kind of partially completed. Um, but it gave, it gave us some really useful feedback, actually. It has some kind of qualitative, well, quantitative measures of usability as well. I should have actually popped some of these in here. Um, but if anybody's interested, I can share them with you. Um, but there were some of the issues that came out. So things that were like uh, were reported were things that having a constant search bar present. Um, the fact that there's not a language filter. So the people were appreciating that the results are presented in different languages, but they wanted to be able to filter by the languages that they actually understood themselves. Um, they wanted to have a bit more feedback when carrying out filtering actions. Sometimes it wasn't that obvious if, if the filtering had happened or not. Um, so a little bit about feedback there. Um, some of them reported that they wanted to know where the data is harvested from. Um, and they also reported wanting to kind of have some highlights of resources on the, the landing page of GoTriple. Um, and plus things like showing what the syntax would be for when you do a search using multiple words. So these are all things that have been taken into account. Um, so I know um, we were, the developers have been working really hard and, uh, and uh, also Julio for the, you know, the visual development and design of the platform. Um, so some of the other issues were just filtering problems. Um, sometimes there were a bit of a lack of clarity about what topics are you know, or what the topic terms are. Um, and the types of material, because I think there's a long list of different types and people were a little bit confused by some of them. Um, and again, this, this knowing um, which articles are available to view without a paywall. So like that, I know for, for a fact, I can show you in the next slide, um, has been addressed. So this is some of the, the latest things that Julio has been sharing with us. So now we can see on the Your Search, we can see actually which items are available with the search with a green bar. Um, and the one on the bottom left hand side, I think you can see the green means it's open access. So that, this has been already adapted to, you know, to show the user which items are, are accessible and which, you know, maybe not. Um, and I think they had then have the option as well on the bottom right, you can see you could actually click that switch to only be able to view things that are freely available for download. Um, so it's given the user a lot of choice of a um, you know, these, these issues that were important to them. Um, we can see as well the kind of, uh, the kind of icons here, because I think one of the things that were reported was that they didn't actually know what a knowledge map or stream graph would produce. Um, so having this kind of visual bar above the, the, the two items really seems to, you know, enhance it and, and users would then know what to expect should they want to make a stream graph. 
Um, so yeah, very responsive and it's happening quite quickly. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what the next release is, which is going to be happening hopefully quite soon. So um, we will just not have just the, the current beta version, but the, the next version will have a lot more features introduced. And at this point, I'll be looking to, to really fully make use of the uh, user testing group. So um, that's brought me to the end of this presentation. Um, so thanks very much for your attention. If anybody's got questions at this point, um, I'm happy to try and answer them. Okay, I think there's a Mentimeter that uh, Francesca wants you to fill in at the end, but yes. I'll answer so, questions yeah. when we're doing that. I stop sharing my screen? Or? Yeah, thank you, Paula. Thanks again for this uh, very clear and rich presentation. I personally learned a lot. <laughs> so um, I want to thank you again. And uh, you, uh, you will find the slides uh, thereafter in the next days that I wrote in the chat uh, on Zenodo and uh, a link will be present as well in the Threefold Open Science Training Series page, web page on uh, Go3.4 uh, project uh, um, website. Uh, there are a few questions for you, Paula. Uh, and uh, I start with the first one, which is uh, from Ashley. How might you engage with leaders that are, are resistant to user-centered methods and practices? Uh, concerns that it might be too time in intensive, for instance. Hey, that's an excellent question, actually. Um, thankfully, I have to say on this project, um, I think the, the, the developers and the, the people involved in the design are really actually you know, do see the, the value of the user-centered design approach. So I'm not having to come up against this. They're not very resistant. They, they are um, seeing the usefulness of it. Um, in past projects, I have encountered this, I have to say. Um, so yeah, I think sometimes, especially when they say, you know, they're so set on doing things in one way, and then you've found that um, the research, the, the users are really not enjoying that. It can be quite difficult. Um, especially if they're at a stage in the program. Now, hopefully you find these things very early on and they've not invested time and effort. Um, that's, the, that's the key. But if it's a later thing that there's suddenly an issue with, it can be quite a challenge to explain to them, you know, how this might have such a negative impact on the usability and the uptake of the platform. So yeah, it can be quite difficult. But thankfully in, in GoTriple, as I say, there's not such an issue. Um, but yeah, it can be, and I think if, if you were to, do, to have this problem, it's important to kind of really iterate what the, what harm could be done and, you know, how you might lose users. Thanks. Maybe I can uh, link to a related question, which is still from Ashley. What is the experience like working with the designers? and more technical folks that are building the platform. How do you prepare for these conversations? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the designer in this case is Julio and he's actually very, um, he's also um, have a background in sort of this user-centered design, which is, you know, excellent. So as I say, they're fully on board. So I don't have much work to do there. Um, the developers, um, yeah, sometimes forgetting the technical. So I think I've been doing this quite a long time now, so I kind of now understand some of the issues around the technical aspects. So, um, but it can be a challenge where there's a lack of understanding of between the two. So the technical and the usability sometimes can be quite far apart. Um, but I think it's just a case of communicating well. So I think if you present timely things and it can be a challenge because sometimes you're doing the testing and it's like there's a lot going on and you need to report back quickly um, but kind of making a prioritization um, of what's really important um, some things are less important somebody reports back that they they don't like the purple color or something you know it's not such a showstopper and it's not you know a massive thing it's uh, it's just a kind of personal choice but certain things I think things like the constant search bar was definitely a big one, but um, that's been acted on quite quickly. Thanks a lot. 
And another question from Agnieszka, were there any new pain points after conducting user scenarios? Um, I think the new things and because it wasn't available in any um, previous search engine and it's due to the, the kind of novelty of the GoTriple platform. So some of it has been around the multilingual aspect, um, which has been a little bit of a surprise to people because they haven't encountered it before. So I think that has been, um, you know, that wasn't able to be worked out in advance because it wasn't there. Um, so that has been new and the fact that this filter is now needed, people want to filter out by language. Um, so we probably couldn't, you know, um, have expected that from the previous work that we did because it's a novelty. So things like that. Thank you very much. The last question is from myself <laughs> and it's uh, about uh, what has been the most surprising uh, uh, thing that you have found while mm. doing this research? Um, for me, I think it's just been the sheer number and variety of the different tools that people use. Um, so before I've worked actually with life scientists and it, it tends to be a much narrower um, you know, set of tools and software platforms, whereas for social science and humanities, because the topics are so diverse, then people use so many different tools and it's, you know, it was quite a lot to get your head around, I think, initially. So that's been the most surprising thing for me. And I think that's why I've kind of wanted to concentrate on this kind of mapping process to kind of capture it. Um, so yeah, that was that was very surprising, just the sheer number and, and divergence of the different tools and ways of doing things. Thank you, thank you very much. So we will use uh, few minutes more of your time. I'm sharing with you a final survey uh, regarding the organization of this training event and the learning outcomes. I hope you can see my screen. You can use, uh, you can go on Menti and use the code uh, that you can read here and you find in the chat as well. Uh, our first uh, question is about how much you enjoyed this training session. Great, we have great results. Thank you, Paul, again. And uh, our second question is about uh, your expectations. We have four answers. Maybe I can wait a bit more to see your answer, to wait for your answers. Please feel free to complete this survey, which is very useful for us. And then we would like to know if you felt empowered to share your own ideas and to ask your questions. We have three, four answers, five answers. So I'm happy. That you, that you found the room to express yourself as well. Six answers. And then we would like to know how much this topic was relevant to your own work, your own activity. Four answers. So most of you are highly committed to this uh, topic. Six answers. Okay. And last question I think is about if you are interested in being formed after this 
training session on the coming uh, events we are organizing. We have a program with uh, at least a few, uh, five new, new events uh, to be organized during uh, this year. And uh, let me see. Okay, so it's a success. Okay, so let me thank you again for participating in this uh, training event. And thanks again, Paula, for coming and uh, yeah, for illustrating uh, how, uh, how complicated it is, how complex, but also really interesting and fruitful is uh, the work you are doing in uh, VP3. Thank you, I enjoyed presenting that. I should actually want to take this opportunity to thank all the people who've taken part in all the different, um, you know, the, the testing sessions and the user-centered design workshops that I've done because without having users to get involved, there wouldn't be any user research. So um, thanks to everybody that's uh, done that. And I do recognize quite a few names on the, the list. So uh, I know quite a few of you have actually participated. So thanks again. Thank you. Have a nice afternoon, everybody. Bye.